Hello, Gretchen. Hey, Maggie. This week, we are moving from the deliverance of God's people to they've been on a journey that we can't go through all of, but they are now in the promised land, God's earthly place for them. But this earth is not perfect. So what what kinds of challenges and desires do God's people still have at this point? Yeah. So once the Israelites arrived in the promised land after 40 long years of wandering in the wilderness, again, we can't go into all of that right now, but they finally arrive in the land of Canaan and they see the other nations around them and they want a king like them. In 1 Samuel 8 verse 5, they come to Samuel and they say, now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. They weren't content with God, the creator of the universe, as their only ruler. So God gave them what they desired. So God appoints a king. And what is this king like? The first king to rule over the Israelites was King Saul. And he was tall and handsome. I think of him as just like tall and debonair, you know, but He didn't have the strength of character that a true God-fearing king would have. And because King Saul disobeys God, God actually appoints another man to be king over his people, except this person is completely unexpected, does not look like King Saul. And yet again, we see that God uses unlikely people. He uses the people that we would normally cast aside and say, oh no, like they're not meant for this role in leadership. Like we just talked about in the last week, Moses, why would Moses be the one that would lead the people out of slavery in Egypt? Because God chose him. And the same thing is true with this next King. Yeah. Saul was the king the people thought that they wanted, and Jesus, and not Jesus, Jesus is, but David is the king that God knew they needed. Yes. Ultimately, God knows what's best for us. And a lot of times we think that um, we see this is the right person or this is the right way. And yet God, as we're going to see with David, he doesn't look at outer appearance. He doesn't look at your long resume of achievements. He looks at the heart and in first Samuel 16, verse seven, the Lord says to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him for the Lord sees not as man sees man looks at the outer appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so God is setting up that look, Saul, maybe what the people thought they wanted, but he's not who the people needed. Instead, he has Samuel go and he looks through all of these different sons. And yet there's one because God keeps saying, nope, not that guy, not that guy, not that guy. It ends up being David, who's Mm -hmm. a lowly shepherd of the people, who is the youngest, who's just not the most likely person to be chosen by the people. And yet God chooses him because of his heart. But we even see as David's story progresses that even David fails. Even David sins grievously and turns from God. But David was not the ultimate king that they were waiting for. Though God chose David, David was not the perfect one. He was not the Messiah. He was meant to point us forward to King Jesus who would come. And David has a son and his son named Solomon would actually be king after him. And again, there's so many details to David's story that you'll have to read, but we're just pulling out a few different things. Vaughn Roberts explains that under the rule of Solomon, he says God's people are in God's place and under his rule and are enjoying his blessing. So they're finally, they're in the promised land. There's peace throughout the land, but that doesn't last long because just like Maggie said at the beginning of this, what we live through in this life is never perfect. So even Solomon, he fails and he turns to the things of this world and he gathers idols and wives and all of these different things rather than solely worshiping and living under the rule of God. So after Solomon, what kinds of Kings follow him? What happens to the King's people? 
all kinds of kings follow him. They actually go into this really rebellious cycle. So some of the kings that were raised up, they they follow God and they love him. But there's no king that removes all of the high places. There's no king that um, that removes all of the idols and all of those things that the people keep running to like the nations around them. And there's also kings that rise up and they just sin against the Lord. They immediately turn their backs from God and um, in the in his ways and his law, and they erect these high places. They call the people to worship these idols. And under, uh, under these king's rules, the kingdom of God actually divides into two. And when you're reading scripture, it can get a little bit confusing because Israel divides into two. But one, the top part is Israel and the bottom is Judah. And so as you're reading Israel after the divided kingdom, it's actually talking about one nation. And then you're reading about Judah, which is another because God's kingdom divided under the rule of these kings because the people's hearts became hardened. And because their hearts became hardened, they became wayward and they started to worship these idols that are made of stone and um, uh, just man-made things, which ultimately were made by God, which is so what we do today, right? Like Mm -hmm. God made these rocks, God made this granite, God made this gold. And yet we think we can fashion idols that will serve us rather than serving the one true God who is the creator of all things. So the people, they turn from their one true king and sin rules over their hearts. And we see that when God is not king, that we become distracted by the things of this world. And those things never offer us the hope, the peace, the leadership, the satisfaction that we long for. So when the people follow other kings and they follow these idols and sin rules their life, what does the true king do? The true king is true to his word. Mm -hmm. So if you look back at the law of God, when he was giving the law to his people, he said, if you will follow me, then they will have these blessings being under his rule. But if they choose not to follow him and to disobey him, there would be judgment. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets hard. I think for us, we go, the Lord judges them. And it's easy for us to get that God is holy. He cannot tolerate sin in his presence. He cannot tolerate sin in the hearts of his people because God is holy. God is also just because God is just, he is also a righteous and a holy judge. And so God is their true King. He casts judgment on them due to their waywardness. And this judgment doesn't come out of left field. The people had known that this would be the repercussions of their sin. And ultimately, the destruction of Israel is due to their idol worship that happens under these kings who turn away from the law of God. And one of the things we talked about when we say the kingdom of God is the king's power over the king's people and the king's place, his power is his rule, is his law, is his authority. So when we step out from that, then we reap judgment. And ultimate judgment was their exile to these pagan nations. And they were no longer in God's place experiencing that peace and God's blessing. Yeah, this is really convicting for me because when I see, I I relate with the people of Israel. Like sometimes we want the comfort of the leadership and authorities in our lives and we elevate them to be king, to be more important than God has placed them to be. And so personally for me, a few years ago, it came to light that the head pastor at our church had had several moral failings. Um, I won't go into them here, but it was more than having put him up on a pedestal This man, when faced with these sins, chose not to repent. And so it was just felt like so discouraging. It made me both so sad and so angry too, that God's, this person who was supposed to be leading us all to God was actually turning away from him. And I saw many people in our congregation still continue to follow this man because as much as we had said, we're all about the gospel here. That's what's central. Our church had in so many ways placed 
its identity in this one pastor. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times in these scary circumstances in our world, it can be easy to place our identity and our hope in something in the government, even in like someone specific or our or our local church as like the thing that's going to hold us together. And ultimately all of those things will fail us. Only the leadership of God is faithful. He's the only one that never changes. And so our church after that walked through three years of wilderness of life without a lead pastor in the midst of COVID. And it was really hard, but it was like, God just kept reminding us over and over again, I am the one who's faithful. I am the one who will never fail you. And praise the Lord, our new lead pastor started a couple of weeks ago. And I'm looking forward to being in a, like maybe out of that wilderness season, but I don't want to forget right. where my hope is. I don't want to let coming out and coming um, to an easier season be a place where I, like the Israelites, then look to lesser hopes than God, to right. lesser leaders. I want to make sure that he stays my focus as the king. He's the place where I put my hope and he is the one that I know will always be faithful. And I feel so, like it's a warning to us too, that yeah. our own hearts, you may think, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to turn from the Lord. I'm not going to be puffed up with pride and, um, you know, find my, maybe it's like, I'm not going to place my hope in this leader, or maybe it's, I'm not going to place my hope in myself. And mm -hmm. in those moments, we start to, again, let down our guard and pride starts to grow because we think that we're greater than that. And I feel like this is a warning to us to place our hope in God and to be humble before him and realize mm -hmm. that these leaders will fail. We will fail, but ultimately only he will never fail us. And he is our hope. Yeah. And he is always faithful to be with us because we are his people yes. and he is exercising his power for us. Like we said last week, maybe not in our time or in the way that we hope, but he is in a way that will lead us to his place that will lead us to his presence. And so that is our ultimate hope in any circumstance. Amen.